like to introduce our I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Our, we have two, and it's Dennis Hazel and Robert Barden. And Dennis and Bob are both on our um, Forestry Extension faculty here at NC State University. Bob is actually the Associate Dean for Extension and Engagement in the College of Natural Resources here. And he is also um, a registered forester and a certified forester with the Society of American Foresters. And he focuses on using distance learning to deliver natural resource information. Um, Dennis Hazel, who will be our first speaker today, has a degree in wildlife biology with a master in forestry and a PhD also in forestry. He has been with Extension Forestry since 2003, and his responsibilities include forest health and productivity. And his most current work in extension and research has revolved and continues to revolve around biomass policy and wood energy production. So with that, I think I will turn the slides over to Dennis. Thank you, Susan. I want to welcome all of you. We're glad that all of you are participating today. And we're going to be talking, as Susan mentioned, this is one of the series largely from a grant that is shared between North Carolina State University and University of Georgia. Uh, and what I'll be reporting on today is our implementation on a very large scale, operational scale, of biomass harvesting guidelines. How did it work? How did we do it? Lessons learned. And then Dr. Barden is going to talk about inventory techniques for down woody debris. If you're going to have a some kind of a goal for the volumes or percentages of, of uh, debris post logging you want to leave out there. You have to have a pretty reasonable technique for doing the inventory. So um, we'll move on from there. Uh, many of you probably were able to attend Xander's, Xander Evans webinar several weeks ago. If you did, this will be a little bit of a review. But first of all, what are BHGs? BHGs or biomass harvesting guidelines. Who has them? Well, as part of this study that we'll be talking about, one of our master's students, uh, Brunel Googleman, did a study looking at the various states and other uh, entities that have published biomass harvesting guidelines. And uh, his thesis is, is available from NC State's Brunel Googleman. And he looked at the various provisions across these sets of guidelines. But uh, currently, these are states or organizations that have published them. Um, South Carolina is one of the most recent. Forest Guild has perhaps the best known of the forest bio biomass guidelines. And they have published them for the Southeast, Northeast, and Pacific Northwest. and. Uh, they're very comprehensive, but our certification programs also have them. So those, and I should mention that I uh, put the put the question others. There are some other states that you will see sometimes cited as having them. For instance, California and Oregon. But uh, from my reading of what they've published, those are more discussion documents than they are guidelines with specific goals. So I suppose we could we could argue about that. Well, in discussions we've had for many years in North Carolina with foresters, with loggers, uh, and the question of BHGs comes up, the most frequent comment that I hear from them, uh, I'm paraphrasing as, as you see in the bullet, BHGs why do we need BHGs? We already have BMPs, and they're working just fine. In North Carolina, like other states, we do have BMPs, and we do mon monitoring our compliance surveys periodically. And the compliance is very high. You can go to the uh, Southern Group of State Foresters and look at Southwide statistics, very high compliance as well. So if we have BMPs, and they're being used successfully, 
why do we need them? Why do we have them? Why have states adopted them? Well, the, a number of reasons, but here are the, the most common. Uh, first, a concern about the rapid increase that we're seeing in woody biomass use that's creating concerns about over-harvesting debris, concerns about accelerated erosion, loss of nutrient soil carbon, and especially the loss of critical components of wildlife habitat. If you talk to proponents of VHGs or in folks with NGOs that are concerned about biomass harvesting on a large scale, the number one thing that they're likely to talk about is their concerns about wildlife habitat. So basically, these states have taken their water quality BMPs already in place and added to them and published a more comprehensive set of guidelines. Um, and I should note, as I do here, at this point, they're guidelines. They're not mandatory. And for uh, your information, our state environmental regulatory agency in North Carolina, uh, the Environmental Management Commission did do a about a six or eight month study. It was run like public hearings of uh, the potential impacts of biomass harvesting in North Carolina. And in their document, at the end of that, they recommended that North Carolina consider adoption of, of uh, biomass harvesting guidelines. At this point, though, we've not done so. Well, if they're not, if BHGs, biomass harvesting guidelines, are not the same thing as water quality BMPs, what are some of the common provisions across these that differ from the water quality BMPs? Well, the first is downed and dead, dead and downed or down wood retention. Uh, snag retention is in, in many or most of them. Uh, goals or guidelines regarding sensitive areas, and very often they come in the form of uh, staying away from biomass harvesting and things like old growth stands or maybe stands that are or stand types that are targeted for restoration or stands in which there are nutrient issues such as deep sands in North Carolina would be an example that maybe removing biomass is not such a good idea. Another common provision uh, are guidelines regarding wildlife and plant biodiversity or maintaining soil productivity, guidelines regarding civil cultural operations or disturbance. But by far, the biggest and most known provisions of BHGs are the focus in retaining debris is down wood. So how do they, what do these BHGs say regarding down wood? Well, they differ among those that have been published. Some specify percentage goals for retained down wood, some minimum tonnages or both. Some recommend scattering the debris across the site, whereas others recommend leaving debris piles for wildlife. But in all cases, the overall goal is leave more. Well, what is downwood? In this context, we're mostly talking about logging debris, post-harvesting operations. Uh, you may see definitions that uh, are sort of sub-definitions, such as coarse woody debris, which typically is larger material, or fine woody debris, smaller material. Uh, for most logging operations, it, uh, the sources of this down material are tops and limbs left on site normally, or non-merchantable trees normally left on site, can't be used as, as um, round wood, or already dead wood. Loggers who are, or operators who are recovering energy wood do not typically harvest already dead wood. So that stays on site and adds to the down wood. Why is it important? For wildlife, it's important for nesting, feeding, predator avoidance, thermal regulation, avoiding desiccation, reducing erosion. It simply provides physical resistance to flow. and. Most of our state BMPs have uh, provisions on steep slopes or whether uh, ephemeral channels or drainages actually piling woody debris to slow down that flow. So it does accomplish that on sites. Uh, 
And of course, that material is a source of carbon and nutrients as well. So what I'm presenting for the next few minutes is an operational BHG implementation that we did in Georgia in North Carolina. Uh, and the study was entitled Developing Research-Based Biomass Harvesting Guidelines to Improve Sustainability of Harvesting Woody Biomass for Renewable Energy. I think as Susan has already mentioned, there were a lot of players and funders. Uh, the project was largely shared by NC State University and the University of Georgia. Uh, but we also collaborated with Forrest Guild. Xander Evans served as, as a co-PI. We had three host forest industries, Weyerhaeuser, Plum Creek, and Georgia Pacific, who hosted the studies on their site. Uh, majority funding came from NIFA, uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture with USDA, and funding from ANCASI, National Council for Air and Stream Improvement with Forest Industry, Southeast Climate Science Center, and the Biofuel Center of North Carolina, which has recently closed, and that funding has been picked up by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. We do have a website where our presentations and publications are being posted. I didn't list it, but if you're interested, you can see it by uh, going to CNR for College of Natural Resources edu slash best, B-E-S-T. And uh, some of the other participants besides myself on this study were Chris Mormon, our lead PI, our coordinator of our wildlife program at NC State, Stephen Castlebury at UGA, professor of wildlife ecology, Fred Cubbage in our school, uh, deals with forest policy, economics, Xander Evans, Jessica Homiak with Weyerhaeuser, who is a wildlife scientist, Ben Jackson, professor of forestry at UGA, Susan Moore, who began the session today at NC State, Larry Morris at UGA, professor of forest soils, Nils Peterson at NC State, who deals with human dimensions and natural resource systems, and Eric Vance and Ben Wigley with NCASI. So a lot of players. You'll hear more in the coming presentations on some of the some of the objectives, for, including those specifically on wildlife. But the, one of the overall sets of objectives was looking at impacts of biomass removal on wildlife. We also wanted to look at the feasibility of implementing BHGs, which I'm reporting on, and Niels Peterson reported on some interviews in the last uh, webinar. And uh, of course, we're informing stakeholders of results. This is what we're doing today. So we had six treatments that were done on an operational scale in two states. There were four replicates in North Carolina, four in Georgia, all hosted by forest industry. And here are the listed are the six treatments that we used. No biomass harvest at all. That is, just roundwood was removed. We uh, had the log, told the loggers don't recover any fuel chips from that site. Uh, the last one was biomass harvesting as usual, no hands tied for the loggers. And then we had two treatments in which the goal was to leave 30% of the merchantable biomass that they could have recovered. In one case, they were asked to create piles around the site as much as possible, and another to disperse it as much as possible. Then we had uh, two other treatments where the retention goal was 15%. One treatment uh, leaving the debris in piles and one dispersed. So I'm just going to, I'm going to mostly report on the results on the sites in North Carolina. These were managed Loblolly plantations on industry land in the lower coastal plain, warehouser land, 30 plus years. Uh, the sites were predominantly large pines with small to medium diamond or soft hardwoods in the mid-story and understory. And on these sites, when the large pines were felled by the cutting machines, the limbs were stripped off where the stems were felled uh, by the skitter and were not recovered for biomass. The hardwoods were severed and bunched by the cutting machines and skidded to the log deck for chipping along with the pine tops uh, 
that were severed at the logging deck. So the overwhelming volume of biomass that was removed for energy came from the hardwoods that were in the mid-story and understory. So when we were funded, uh, we immediately were faced with the big question, how in the world are we going to implement biomass harvesting guidelines? So we met on site, met with industry foresters and loggers and discussed it. And some of the strategies that we discussed were returning a grapple load of tops, limbs, and small trees from the log deck to the site every third or fifth turn. Um, that's certainly one way of doing it. You can bet the loggers were not in love with that prospect of going back uh, to the site to get another turn of round wood or, or tree stems and dragging tops and limbs with them. And how do you know whether if you do it every third, you're really getting 30% of the biomass or not? Um, another thing that we consider is having the cutter build separate bunches of hardwoods uh, for chipping versus pulpwood. In other words, the, the, the bunches left on site for the skidders to skid to the log deck would either be all for chips or, or pulpwood, hardwood pulpwood. But then how is someone operating a skid or know whether they're really um, leaving a third or a fifth uh, in the case of the 15%? So a company logging supervisor suggested a retention area approach, which uh, kind of seemed to make sense to us and the loggers. And so that's the way we did it. So it looks something like you're seeing on this slide. So here's a depiction of the six treatments. So if you, you're seeing in the lighter green color areas that by percent represent an air, the percent area of a particular treatment. So if you look in the middle at 15 percent, then the lighter green, that's 15 percent of the overall treatment block. And so what we asked the loggers to do for the retention treatments was to get all the round wood off the entire site, uh, the pulp wood, saw timber that they could harvest, get all of the material that they could use for energy for 85% of the site in the case of 15% retention. And the last thing they would do was go into that 15% of the area, retention area. The cutter would cut all of those small and medium sized or crooked, otherwise deformed hardwoods, and then they would either scatter it on the site or in the case of uh, for, for a cluster treatment or, or pile treatment, they would create piles. Same thing for the 30 percent. And so that's the way we ended up accomplishing the BHGs. So a few pictures of the actual operation. You can see from the stand that the major almost everything in the overstory for large loblolly pines, 30 plus years, and the mid-story and understory are where the hardwoods are. So what did it look like afterward? This is one of the sites in which debris was clustered. And so you see piles across the site here, 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 and over here, here, in which the skidders literally took a turn of uh, the material intended for the chipper, the loggers just call them chips, and scatter it from the retention area and drop it in piles. For the scattered, they would attempt to drop a single tree at a time, which of course doesn't work, but they were able to do a pretty good job of scattering. And this is where there were uh, no BHG treatments at all. In other words, the loggers could get whatever they could merchant uh, economically recover. So that's what it looked like. Well, this is the fourth replication in North Carolina. Uh, it's what it actually looks like on the ground in terms of the shapes. So you can see all six blocks over on the left side. No biomass uh, guidelines were in place. This was business as usual. Um, over on the right upper corner is where there was no biomass recovered. And then you can see the 30% treatments and the 15% retention goal treatments. And the hashed areas represent the retention areas. So those are by percent of the treatment block. And you'll see two different kinds of um, figures within those treatment blocks. You'll see 
black dots which represent piles of hardwoods as identified by the students in GPS and inventoried. The triangles represent identifiable piles of pine. So these are basically limbs and tops, which was an artifact of, of the logging and stripping off of the pine limbs by the skitters. And so you can see that there, at least visually from this side, it sort of looks like from a relative sense, the retention goals were, were accomplished with uh, almost, well, in this particular block, no hardwood biomass piles for the no biomass harvesting guideline treatments and the most where there was no biomass removed and then you can see where the 30% and 15% drop out. So how does it all shake out together when we look? Well, I'm, Sarah Fritz was a, one of our two PhD students who worked on this and she'll be reporting on wildlife results in a few weeks. And she had the uh, honor of supervising a number of summer technicians who got to go all over these very large sites in eastern North Carolina, GPSing and inventorying all of these piles. And she looks at the results in several ways. One of them is to look at the volume so of material left on average among the four blocks in North Carolina. So you're looking at cubic meters per hectare of volume, so volume left out there. And you can see how they compare with each other. Important thing to note, which we've noted here in our group for years now, is that always, uh, e even when they're with a normal biomass harvesting, there's always debris left on site. Over many sites that we've studied in the coastal plain in Piedmont, it usually, it on average, it's over seven tons per acre, green tons per acre, where there's a biomass harvesting component. So it's never stripped completely clear. And uh, on our sites, on average, we had two to three times as much, by volume, as much biomass left on the no biomass harvesting sites or treatments as the minimums recommended by Forest Guild for the southeast. But you can see the, how the relative differences stack up here. Another way of looking at it is by making some adjustments on the data. You, we, Sarah looked at the percent of biomass left as a percent of what could have been recovered economically by the loggers. So this is how the, this one shows how the actual retention goals were achieved. If you look at the two 15%, you can see that it's 15 and maybe about 18% is what actually happened when you average them across the four treatments. And of course, the variance is pretty high. And you can see that the 30% achieved more than 30% on average. So this is how things actually shook out. Well, when we were through, we went back and interviewed the loggers to ask what their impression was of having to be the, some of the first in the country to actually implement BHGs. So we asked them, in, in the case of Eastern North Carolina, there were three different loggers. One logger did two of the replications and then another two loggers each did one, and we asked them the same question, uh, or same questions, and one of those questions was, how difficult was it cutting and scattering the debris to be left? And this is one response, or some bullets from the spots. It was really not too bad. A good logger cuts down everything anyway with the cutter. It makes things easier for the site prep guys, plus most landowners like it all down. Spreading out the stems takes some time, but it was not too bad. Another response to the same question was, no, it really was not that bad, just a little extra work, but it was not too bad. Another question that was asked is, how do you think retention should be accomplished if we're ever to have retention guidelines in North Carolina? And I know this is a little bit long, but I thought it was worth putting the entire answer from one of the loggers in, a, in the slide. We could probably do whatever is required, but here's what I think. 
The best way to leave biomass is on a percentage basis. I don't know what six tons per acre looks like, but a percentage could be left easy enough. How would that best be done? Just like you guys did it. Mark off the percent by area and leave that stuff. It does create some work and expense that we have to bear. Um, misspelling on my part in carrying that stuff over the whole track. Issues and concerns. So what are some of the lessons lear learned from this? Well, first of all, the retention area approach may not work for stands that have very variable structure. These were plantations on industry land, very nicely managed. But if it had been if they had been natural stands and we used the retention area approach and where it was mostly hardwoods that in the understory and midstory being used for energy. If you picked a corner of the stand for retention that had a disproportional amount by volume of these hardwoods, you're going to overachieve your retention goal. And of course, the opposite would be the case if it happened to be a part of the stand in which uh, the hardwoods or whatever the biomass component was was not as um, not as abundant. I think a, a point that may be well worth making, though, is this. If we move to do biomass harvesting guidelines or we attempt to implement them where we have them, maybe it really isn't so important that if the goal, for instance, is 15%. And I guess I should mention, if you look at Minnesota's guidelines, you'll see the 20% there. In, in their guidelines. And so what we did in our study is we bounded those. That's where the 30% and 15% came from. But whatever the goal, 15% or a tonnage basis, to use the retention area um, approach, suppose instead of 15 tons, you get 20, or you get 10 or 7 or 8. Uh, if the goal really is to leave more, it still is an operational way of doing it. It just may be you may not get exactly what you're targeting. Another point, retained debris may not make sense at all as a goal of site prep is to be done. So you leave a goal of uh, 15 or 30 percent or some number of tons and it's enough that the landowner chooses to come back and do a prescribed fire or to pile everything up into windrows. What have you accomplished? In the case of our work in, in eastern North Carolina with Weyerhaeuser, uh, the, the retention goals were pretty nicely achieved, but the piles got somewhat rearranged because the sites were V-sheared after logging. So in other words, after the loggers uh, were through and left the scattered debris or the piles, the V-shearing kind of rearranged the material into longer rows. So another observation. Um, and an important point in all this as we move forward and consider whether we're going to adopt PHGs or not is what, who's going to pay for the costs and what will they be? Now we had hoped to learn what the costs were to the loggers in this study and, and we were not able to get the records. It was just too com complicated logistically to do that. But you can bet that if we impose costly operations on loggers, it's going to ultimately come out of the landowner's pockets. So concluding thoughts and comments, so in this study, the retention goals were achieved. Loggers felt the techniques what was, were not too burdensome, but it did come at a cost, although the cost was not measured. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barden, and when he's through, we'll take some questions. Thank you, Dennis. So as Dennis was talking about um, with the implementation of BHGs, uh, biomass hovers guidelines, one of the things that needs to be considered is, is how do you measure this? How do you, what techniques could you use to determine if you have enough uh, forest harvest residues left behind or if there's even a need to leave forest harvest residues behind? So Dennis and I had a graduate student, Nate Osborne, uh, work on a project here at NC State where him and a couple other students went out and measured uh, various logging sites uh, across North Carolina, looking at exactly the question is how much woody debris is left behind following uh, traditional 
harvesting here in North Carolina. And for them to do that, we start to try to figure out a method in which they could accomplish that. One is to look, you could do a line intersect type method, um, which actually takes a fair amount of time to do. Or you could look for another technique that may be uh, less time consuming, but you want to know that uh, the techniques are accurate so that your measurements are reasonable. And so what we did was we had the t uh, students uh, do both line intersect methods and what also is uh, they did a prism sweep sampling method. And what we found out time wise was that with uh, the prism sweep method, they were about six times faster than doing a line intersect method. So it's quite significant if the line intersect method takes you about 14 or 15 minutes to put in versus the prism sweep method, which might take you three minutes, you can see there's quite a bit of time savings, which means also quite a bit of cost savings. So the method we're going to talk about today is this prism sweep method. Um, this was adapted from a paper by Beber and Thomas from 2010. And also we're going to talk about how do you go about measuring uh, slash piles that are left behind also on the site. And this was adopted from Woodall and Monleon in 2007, their paper. With prism sweep sampling, it's similar to uh, measuring uh, in trees. If you're out in the forest looking at uh, stand density, wanting to calculate the basal area of a forest stand or something down that line, often we're familiar with using a, a prism or an angle gauge. And that technique could be then also used for measuring down woody debris. And so in this case, what you're really shooting to measure is the center point of the down uh, woody debris. What we're looking at there is you want to capture right here the midpoint of that forest harvest residue as it lays on the forest floor. When you look through the angle gauge, you want to be able to determine if it's an in piece on the border or out, just like you would with a um, if you were doing standing timber. So I'm going to play here a real quick video um, so that everybody can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. I'm going to launch that video now. OK, bear with me here a second. I've got to share my desktop. So as you see here in the video, you're going to walk out to your plot center. You're going to lay out plots just like you would. Um, you randomly select it across the site, just like you would do for a, a timber stand inventory. You're going to mark your plot center. And as you can see from this image here, uh, Dennis is showing you where the middle of that piece is. With the prism, you're going to try to be as close to the ground as possible looking for the center of those down woody materials, and then basically going along and measuring the length of the pieces. You do a complete 360 degrees around your plot center, making sure to hold your prism over that center point. Let me uh, get back here to Collaborate. So as I was saying, you're going to go completely around that uh, plot center, collecting all that information. Uh, basically, all you're doing is collecting the length of that piece and recording it on a tally sheet. Jake, I'm sorry that you didn't see the video. Susan had the same problem. OK, I apologize, folks. Uh, it seems like the technology didn't work there. So basically, what we were doing was taking uh, 
let me back up a slide here for you. Basically, we found the plot center, which was about right to, uh, where my hand is here. And in that plot center, we used a prism just like you would in a four timber stand uh, to capture the stuff. So, Jake, you have an idea how it works? Great. Sorry again, folks, if you didn't see the video. So, with that, using this method, though, things that you have to take in consideration. So, uh, you must have a clear line of sight. Uh, so, for example, in this picture here, you got all these different trees growing in amongst the coarse woody debris. As you could imagine, you wouldn't be able to see pieces that are in. Other limitations is if the materials uh, scattered in layers across the site, you would miss the lower layers where you wouldn't be able to see the down woody material. So as you're going around your plots, you're gathering all this, uh, the length of all these pieces, and from that information, you will actually be able to record that um, and calculate the amount of scattered material across the site. I'm going to actually send you a link in the chat window. This is a link to the publication, in which that has uh, explains the method and also provides you sample plot sheets for gathering data. Other limitations, with the, as you can imagine, if you're not down close to the ground with the prism, um, you're going to have difficulty uh, measuring small diameter pieces. You just will miss those because of the angle and the length from the prism to the center point of the piece. And also the fact that small pieces can be hidden behind larger pieces or under the soil or on the forest floor. So it's important when um, conducting uh, the prism sweep that you want to make sure that you're bent down and as close to the ground as possible. You don't have to lay on the ground, but uh, the closer you are down to the ground, the more accurate you'll be in conducting the prism sweep. So now we're going to move on to um, slash pile sampling. This is a bit different. Um, the important point here to remember is with measuring uh, slash piles, you want to make sure that uh, when looking at your site, observe your site to see if the piles are randomly scattered across the site or if they're systematic on the site. If it's uh, randomly scattered across the site, um, this method works well. If they're systematically uh, across the site, what you're going to want to do is consider measuring each pile for calculating its volume. With random scattered piles, what you're going to do is when you're at your plot center, uh, once you're done measuring the scattered woody debris, you're going to measure out 24 feet from that plot center. And what you're going to do then is estimate the proportion of the pile that falls within that plot. So the center of the pile has to be within 24 feet of your plot center, and then you're going to estimate the proportion of that pile. So for example, uh, your pile may be plot centers within 24 feet. Maybe you just hit it, so half of your pile is inside the plot center. You're going to measure, record that then as 50%. You're going to next estimate the packing density of the pile, and we'll talk about that here in a second. And then you're going to determine the shape of the pile. Determining the shape of the pile will determine which measurements you're actually going to take of the pile. So let's talk about packing density here. Um, basically, what we're talking about when we talk about packing density is the amount of airspace um, in proportion to the amount of wood space. So what we're looking at is, is how much density of the piles considered airspace versus wood space, and you're going to record that between a 0 and 1. So for example, from these two pictures, as you can see, this pile is fairly open. Uh, 
not very dense, a lot of airspace, and so it's going to have an estimate of 0.2 for the proportion. For the a more dense pile, such as this one, where things are really piled up, not a lot of airspace, you can't. Uh, you can see that it's quite dense. It's going to have a higher rating of 0.7. Most piles, I think, when you go through the sampling method, you will find will fall in this range between 0.2 and 0.7. It's rare that you get uh, much higher than that. Shape codes, as I indicated, determine uh, what measurements that you take from a pile. There's actually four shape codes used uh, in this process. Uh, shape code 1, 2, 3, and 4, as you can see from these diagrams, are designed for the various type of piles you might have. Uh, word of caution, when looking at your piles, it's important to make sure you walk around them. Uh, the face of a pile may be misleading in its shape. So we're going to do a real quick poll here. I'd like you guys to give me an idea of what shape you think this pile is, A, B, C, or D, based on these shape codes. Okay, it looks like most of you have responded. Let me publish those up to the board so everybody can see. And those that answered A are correct. It is shape code 1. As you can see, it pretty well fills a cone shape, or a half circle, I guess, in this image. And with that, you would measure the width of the pile, and you would take the height of the pile. And you would record these on your um, plot sheet along with the packing density, the shape code, as I indicated earlier, and the percentage of the pile that's within the 24 feet. And with that information and a formula that's provided in the um, fact sheet, which is posted on forestrywebinars.net under today's uh, webinar, so you, you can click on that if you need a copy of it. As I mentioned, uh, with piles that are systematically spread across the site or maybe along the roadway going into the site, if you need to measure the volume of those to see how much is there, you would most likely want to measure all of the piles. And just uh, to point out, there is a uh, um, couple things you want to consider. One thing is, when might you want to use this technique? Uh, we've done this technique with a couple trainings we've had here recently, and the question I often get is, why, why would I want to do this? You know, well, for one, you may want to do it uh, to see if you're within compliance to your biomass harvest guidelines if you have those. But if you don't have biomass harvest guidelines, you may want to be doing this to see how much woody debris is being left behind. Um, this could be shared with loggers if they're not using chippers in their operation to give them an indication of how much material may be available if they were chipping. So you could use it to help promote uh, chipping of a site. Other thing is you could use it also for um, if you are following biomass harvesting guidelines, using it before the logger leaves the site to check up and follow behind them to make sure the round, right amount of material is being left behind. And with that, Susan, I believe we'll uh, open it up for questions. OK, thanks, Bob and Dennis. That was really a lot of information um, and very valuable, I think, for future biomass harvesting use. We have a question from Bob Hedberg. Could you use a plot with four fixed distance and, and angle from center using a plumb bob tally diameter of material present or not? 
Uh, good question, Bob. I'm not sure. Um, it's possible. I'm not a uh, mathematician or a calculus, so this is, would be a bit out of my uh, scope. I think what you'll find, though, is tallying diameter would be very difficult with having to pick up materials and get tapes under them and things like that versus this method, which only relies on length. Anyone uh, else have a question right now? Uh, Susan, can I make a comment while we're waiting for some other questions? Yes, please. And Bob mentioned several reasons why the technique might be used. Uh, this week, I got a uh, set of calls from uh, one of our larger consulting forestry firms in North Carolina who is uh, planning to use that technique to do post-harvest inventory of debris to see whether there's enough material left out there to encourage a second operation where someone comes in just to recover the material for energy. Um, and so what they're planning to do is to come up with some minimum diameter uh, of material they think of someone would go after depending on the kind of equipment they have and they'll only tally that material. So um, interesting application. Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Caitlin. Are the piles as effective with erosion protection as scattering the debris? I think, well, that's, uh, in general terms, scattering is probably better. But again, uh, if you have a site in which there are areas of the site that have concentrated erosion problems, you could ask a logger to intentionally put the piles where those uh, channels are. And in that case, it would be a, uh, a targeted effort to reduce erosion with piles. So in that case, the piles would be better. Yeah, so I think it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and yeah, Jake comments, we often use piles where problems are bigger. Um, the next question is from Jake. He says, I do mostly shelter wood and individual tree selection using biomass for low thinning. How should I use the technique, and are there important differences? Uh, good question, Jake. Um, with the technique for measuring scattered down woody debris, really it's, it's designed for a method where you have good clear sight lines. So without that, you, you really have to rely on another technique to get an accurate measurement of your coarse woody debris. That's where you may have to consider using the line intersect method. Um, to measure how much you are leaving behind. It will be more time consuming, but it's probably a more appropriate method than the prism sweep method. And Sarah, our graduate student, may talk about it in a couple of weeks, but uh, they've been following the, the decay of the material on the sites in North Carolina. And, uh, and once the site starts to revegetate, uh, the prism technique is out the window. You, can, you can't see material anymore. So sometimes second year following harvest, uh, the prism may not be effective. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I don't think we have any more questions at this time. So um, why don't I say thank you to both our presenters and remind everyone our next webinar is May 8th. And that will be our doctoral student who recently, uh, I think, completed her defense. And she is going to present on the small mammal and amphibian response to biomass harvesting under these guidelines that we were implementing. We also have a, a webinar June 4th on the birds effect on birds and invertebrates, and July 8th, we have the soil impacts to wrap up our series. So thank you all for attending. I'm going to ask Bob Barden to push out the link. And um, you can take the quiz there to get your
uh, CFEs or wildlife credits. So, thank you, everyone. So, as Susan mentioned, I'm going to pass out the link for uh, CFEs. What's going to happen is it's going to open the browser on your computer if it isn't already open. So, it may show up behind uh, your Collaborate session. Um, and it may take a minute for it to load. Excuse me, I apologize. I just pushed out the wrong link. Let me do that again. I sent you the link to the Collaborate session, and that will not uh, work for you. So, let's see if we can do that again. And as a reminder, we do have both SAF and the um, Wildlife Society credit for these webinars. I'm also posting it in the uh, chat window, and you can click on it there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Good day.